Hello, people of God. Welcome to the Let's Keep Our Education Catholic Podcast. Recall in episode three, I narrated the journey of the Portuguese missionaries and their efforts in establishing the first formal education in Nigeria, which were Catholic schools, and how such great endeavor was affected by slave trafficking, and as such, it came to a complete collapse in 1688. In this episode, we will look at what historians and scholars have conceptualized as the second endeavor, which could be described as the revival of Catholic schools after the collapse. Slave trafficking, having lasted for over 300 years, was officially declared illegal by Britain in 1807. Shortly after that, you know, why society was healing from the reality of this uh, transatlantic slave trading and people accepted the fact that their family members and relatives had been sold to a land of no return. So it took a while for the missionaries to make the second journey. In 1861, the Society of African Missions expanded their missionary territory from Sierra Leone to Lagos, Nigeria. There, they established the first Catholic agricultural school. Extending to Lokoja, Nigeria, they set up the first convent for nuns. Not so much were recorded about the Society of African Missions and Catholic schools at the time until the arrival of the Holy Ghost Fathers known as the Spiritans. The establishment of the first Catholic schools in Igbo land was preceded by the arrival of the Holy Ghost Fathers in 1885. The Holy Ghost Fathers embarked on a journey of redeeming slaves and in some cases through repurchasing, you know, in order to set the slaves free, they fed these slaves, took care of them and gave them an education Starting in Onicha in 1886, the Holy Ghost Fathers approached the traditional rule of Onicha, stating clearly their goal of evangelization and knowledge acquisition. They delved into it along with the collaboration of the traditional ruler, and later the entire community cooperated after their initial withdrawal, which is based on some substantial reasons that we shall talk about in the next episode. Nonetheless, the mission of the Holy Ghost Fathers flourished. Later on in the early 90s, with the arrival of Father Legion, the Holy Ghost Fathers saw the need to train educators. So they expanded their scope to training teachers and catechists. Around the same period in 1902, Father Joseph Shanahan, who was later made a bishop, penetrated the hinterlands, establishing Catholic schools. Bishop Shanahan, in his approach, made significant impacts in the lives of the people and in the number of schools he set up, both boarding and day schools and several teachers' training colleges. So up to the arrival of the Holy Ghost Fathers, we scholars have described as an era of exclusive missionary education, the colonial government did not pay attention to education. It was in that same year in 1902 when Bishop Shanahan and his Holy Ghost Fathers were making amazing impacts that Frederick Lugard, the British High Commissioner in the region, mandated the Christian missionaries to focus on the non-Muslim areas. And you can recall that before the arrival of the Holy Ghost Fathers, the Society of African Missions were already in the North Central Lokojakogi state. So Frederick Lugard gave the missionaries orders never to penetrate the Muslim areas. As a result, Christianity and Catholic schools boomed in the South. Why the British colonial government, you know, we are faced with the realities of the widespread of Catholic school education in the South? 
1925, they offered the first educational policy, which is called a paper policy. This was to demonstrate their interest and superiority in the Christian educational system that was ab initio established and managed by the missionaries. Here are some highlights of the policy. The policy emphasized religious and moral training to be regarded as fundamental to the development of sound education. Of course, the missionaries had that aspect covered as it is central to Catholic identity. Secondly, the policy reads, schools run by voluntary agencies which attain a satisfactory standard of efficiency should be regarded as of equal importance in the scheme of education with schools directly organized by the government and should be given grants in aid. Here, the policy had to place superiority on government schools that were established in later years, using the government schools as a yardstick to measure schools of high standard. And by qualifying to that standard, you could be given grants in aid. The next part of the policy focuses on the importance of teachers' training. Finally, from the four areas that I shared here, the policy highlighted the relevance of women's education. This part was already recognized by Bishop Shanahan, which led to the invitation of the Sisters of the Holy Rosary to work in the area and focus more in supporting the education of the girl child. No doubt, some aspects of the policy by the colonial government was invaluable as they provided a structural framework for Catholic schools and the missionaries. And the policy guided Nigerian education from 1925 to 1945. With the retirement of Bishop Shanahan in 1932, Father Charles Heary took over the Ministry of Growing Catholic Schools until Nigeria's independence in 1960. From 1886 to 1960, Catholic schools flourished under the leadership of the missionaries amidst challenges and tribulations. That will be it for this episode. I shall continue in the next episode exploring the unalloyed efforts of the missionaries in keeping our education Catholic. Thank you and God bless you as you continue to keep our education Catholic.